Thanks for coming uh, to our reading. My name is Brett Shepard. I direct the Creative Writing Program here at the University of Idaho. Uh, this is our first Distinguished Visiting Writer of the Year, but this tradition goes back to the late 1970s. So I say that because it's great to think about how many writers we've brought into Moscow, uh, to the Moscow Pullman area to read, and we're very happy to have Kent Myers join that uh, list tonight. So quick programming note before we get going. We have a couple of readings coming up later this semester in October in conjunction with Washington State University. We have Terry Tempest Williams and Brooke Williams coming to Moscow. That is October 5th, a Monday in the 1912 Center. So more information will be posted about that very soon. We also have our next distinguished visiting writer, Allison Joseph, a, an acclaimed poet, fantastic writer, fantastic teacher, coming November 12th to read as well. So stay tuned for those events, follow us on Facebook, look at our English department website, and you can have more information about that. Uh, also, books are for sale courtesy of Book People in the front, which when you walked in, you were there. Uh, Kent will be signing books directly out to the left at that little table after the reading as well. We will also be taking questions for Kent. We'll have time for a couple of questions after his reading. So please uh, think about what those might be, and we'll ask them after he reads. Please silence your phones and other technology for the reading, if you would. To introduce Kent, we're bringing up another special guest and a uh, wonderful writer in his own right. He's one of our MFA students. He was last year's Hemingway Fellow, and this year he's completing his thesis, a novel in progress. And if you were the Hemingway Fellow at the Hemingway Festival last year, you heard him read from that wonderful piece of work. So, to introduce Ken Myers, please welcome Max Eberts. On behalf of my classmates and, uh, and the MFA program and all the other students here at UI, I'd very much like to thank Scott Slovak, our English department chairman, Brett Shepard, our MFA program director, and all the MFA faculty for making the visits of such distinguished writers as Kent Myers possible. Thank you. So much of Kent Myers' work is about how we are all connected to everything in the world, including each other. We see this in his nonfiction essays as in abandoned farm sites, yuppies, drug wars, and geese, in which he con cautions about a world that diminishes our individual relationships to the community, as well as our community's relationship to the environment, the environment's relationship to individuals and their well-being, and so on. Instead, he tells us we have chosen a world where we have elevated the study of narrow fields rather than the study of relationships between them. And in doing so, we have created a world where the forces of American individualism and the marketplace rule the day, or as he eloquently states, I don't believe we can bo be both psychologically healthy and environmentally diseased any more than I believe a virtual community flickering on computer screens is a real community. Where is the smell of dirt? He wrote that in 1994, over 20 years ago. He gives many wonderful examples of what we are losing in the world, but one of my favorites is of how the farm he grew up on in Minnesota used to be dotted with sloughs down south where I'm from, they call them sloughs, that were essentially of no use to farmers. He writes, almost every farm had at least one slough, a marvelous place full of frogs and ducks and great calling flocks of geese in the fall. Some of the most powerful memories of my childhood are of those flocks, of trying to sneak up on them, and how, when they discovered me, they rose with water on their wings, dripping and shining and crying and making the whole land, my farm, my place, wild. 
Gradually, however, farmers, my father, one of the first among them, began to tile their land, draining these small wetlands. The flocks diminished, and the colonies of muskrats disappeared. The country of my youth has been diminished in its richness, wilderness, and variety by the disappearance of these places. It is a community concern and requires community solutions. I have to wonder why the communities didn't think to drop the property tax on slough land once the ducks and the geese began to disappear, once they realized their children would miss out on what they had known themselves. Why didn't someone argue for potted county roads and geese instead of smooth roads and empty skies? That was like poetry to me. Likewise, in his novels, Kent Myers reveals how all of us in a community are connected to each other. In his most recent novel, Twisted Tree, the name of the small town in South Dakota, where in the first chapter, a chapter as frightening and powerful as Joyce Carol Oates' short story, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Haley Jo Zimmerman, is kidnapped by the Interstate 90 serial killer. And as he is speeding her way down I-90 in his long blue Lincoln Continental, looking for the right exit road along which to murder her, he decides he wants to know all her secrets before he kills her, as the narrator tells us. She'll tell him. He wants her to know. He'll remember everything. He'll carry it inside him so it will never fade. He has in his mind the whole town of Twisted Tree and its streets and windows and eyes and its people passing each other, bearing lives that no one else knows. Everyone has a life that no one else knows. And then the story takes an unexpected turn, and those words ascribed to the Interstate 90 killer uncomfortably haunts us, the reader, as the novel becomes a story about the people of Twisted Tree and their secrets. And each chapter, a self-contained story, uncovers layers of secrets about these people and their town. Secrets that seem to be stirred up by the loss of Haley Joe. Kent Myers is like a miner, skillfully mining their souls, digging away at them, uncovering not only the dark loam of their past, their bruising stones, their sadness, but also their dreams, and now and then a precious gem of spirit and character that is familiar to us, but shimmers with a color we haven't really quite seen before. And as we reach the book's end, we understand all the connections of one person to a community, even the short life of a seemingly inconsequential and troubled person that was Haley Joe, and everyone's connection to each other, though they don't realize it. And it's as if the bones of Haley Joe and all the bones buried in that town are connected to everyone in Twisted Tree. Bones that are a metaphor for each one's connection to the town, to its people, to Haley Joe Zimmerman. We're very honored to have him here. Everyone, please welcome Kent Myers. everybody and Max that was a fantastic introduction it almost makes me feel like I shouldn't read like I should just stop right now that, that, was, that was really great and I really appreciate that um, I am going to read from Twisted Tree and if I have time and you're awake at the end I may read a little bit of new work um, I'll just see how the, how the time goes um, I'm going to read from uh, a couple of chapters in this book that kind of give you a sense of how the book operates. Um, this book is a, like a novel really of a community and of the ways that the community is connected um, by, in, in ways they now even realize. 
so that Haley Joe Zimmerman is kind of the empty center of the novel. I, I like empty centers. I like I like the idea of a book built around something that almost isn't there. And when I first wrote this book, the first chapter did not exist. I was intending to write the book so that um, Haley Jo Zimmerman never even appears in it, and yet she feels to be the main character, um, known through the lives of other characters. But uh, when I got done with the book, I realized I had to write a first chapter in which she actually does appear, but she appears only to disappear, as Max indicated. Um, I'm not going to read that first chapter, however. Um, I'm going to read um, some later chapters to give you a sense of how the book is, is fit together. I had to index this book and locate every single character and every single time they appear because um, a, a character will be a main character in a in a chapter, and then later that character may be a minor character in another chapter, and then maybe an almost disappearing character in another chapter. And so this book is woven together with these characters who kind of pop in, and then they pop out. And one of the um, one of these characters is a, is a semi driver, a truck driver, a long haul truck driver named Lowell Breslin, who kind of weaves through the book. Um, you can kind of follow him every time you find a semi in the book you can assume it's Lowell Bresnan, you know, going through the lives of these people. Um, and so I'm going to read a chapter where Lowell Bresnan is a main character, along with a young um, Lakota uh, man named Eddie Littlefeather. It may be worthwhile to talk a bit about symbolism here. Um, you can read a book, of course, any way you choose to and interpret how you want, but my vision of this of this particular chapter as a driving symbol is that Eddie Littlefeather is Native American, he's dyslexic, he's left-handed, and he's gay. And I don't know um, of anything that industrial America is going to run over <laughs> more than that combination of, of characteristics. And so the, the semi in this uh, chapter is is that kind of symbolism. Um, I had Thomas Hardy's poem about the Titanic and the iceberg very much in mind as I wrote this chapter. You know, these two big things inevitably coming together, and what happens as a result. Chapters told in varying in in, in it'll be Lowell's voice, it'll be Eddie's voice, it's like that. I mean Eddie's perspective. First Eddie's perspective on Lowell's. So it's called Losing to Win. So this is Eddie first. The smell of asphalt and the stars rolling. The moon approaching, doubling, breeding itself, a moon calm. Oh man. And that rumbling. His ear pressed against the pavement. Eddie Little Feather feels more than hears it like it could shake apart his skull. Lowell now. Was a time Lowell Bresden saw mountains where no mountains were, where no mountains ever been. He tried to tell Arena about it, sitting on the edge of his bed at the Gold Star Inn in Lone Tree, South Dakota, still shaking. But he knew Lorena would be standing with one elbow on the microwave and her forehead in her hand and the phone in the other, her hair falling over her face, watching Abby through it, and wondering what kind of story he was telling this time. Listening beyond his words for other breathing or a muffled giggle. Listening so hard she couldn't hear what he was saying. Listening right past his words to what wasn't there. Still he tried. How his headlights had gone into the night and plucked mountains from the eastern seaboard. Mossy tree-grown mountains. Plucked them from over the horizon and set them down in the middle of the highway, except they were moving. Headlights will do that to you. You stare into them long enough, make you forget distance and perspective, so you can believe for a moment the whole damn continent has sucked itself together, and the Appalachians have just slid to the middle of South Dakota, and you're going to climb up into them, engine grunting like a hog toward the stars. And then, sweet Jesus Christ, it was Buffalo. 
their humps in his headlights. It was like he'd driven the rig right into the past, or time had leaked through a crack in itself, and the next thing he'd see was Indians on horses chasing. But Lorena wasn't hearing any of it. He could see her shaking her head until the microwave car had moved on the vinyl he'd installed the last time he had two weeks without a haul. He finally stopped talking, and when she said, Lowell, I just, and then didn't say any more, he looked at the dirty motel carpet and his white socks lumpy on his feet and whispered, I damn near died, Lorena. You imagine hitting Buffalo at 65? Even in a rig? You imagine? But he knows she won't imagine it. Won't? How mountains came and went. How the past appeared. No mirage or apparition. And there he was, roaring at it. Sixty-five. A hundred yards. Loaded down. The earth rumbling. Eddie lifts his ear away from it and gazes at the moons. Stars lie above him like marbles as if he could reach out, take one of those moons off the horizon and hold it between his thumb and finger like a steely and knock the stars beyond the rim of the sky. When he was a kid, he was ruler of the dust, chief of the chalk circle. He squatted so low, taking aim that the circle stretched into an oval and the marbles loomed like monuments within it. He could smell the chalk. He smells it now, dusty and alkaline through the smell of bile. He feels like a glove turned inside out, that's it. That's just how he feels, inside out. He always lost his left hand gloves and his grandmother would turn his right hand ones inside out. Her fingers peck like a bird and the gloves bunched tight inside themselves and fingers hard cloth knots that relented and turned soft again. He wear the gloves out the door, the seams all frayed and cottony, but he'd take them off before he got to school. They couldn't afford new gloves and it was his fault for losing the left-hand ones. He'd take them off to touch things, pick things up, and then forget. So he wore the inside-out gloves without complaint until he was gone from his grandmother's sight, then stuffed them into his jacket pocket so no one else would see. The tips of his fingers went numb. He had to press his pencil into the paper just to feel it in his hand, pressed so hard he ripped the paper, and the letters he was struggling to make would be swallowed up as if by an opening mouth. Lowell stood on the brakes. He felt the load in the back shift, then worse, that first faint judder that would become a jackknife at 65. Might as well strap on explosives. He remembered later after hanging up the phone as he stared at the cigarette burn in the motel carpet and burn like a brown wounded mouth, how he'd had this vision of the entire rig sliding around like a big clock hand and scraping the buffalo right off the face of the earth and everything exploding, metal and meat and cargo, and he a part of it. Just more chunks. When they came to sort it out, they wouldn't know him from buffalo, and Lorena would walk through that scene, arms crossed, trying to pick out what was him, and shake her head at the impossibility. He'd let off the brakes to prevent the jackknife, the buffalo seemed to be sliding sideways toward him on black reflective ice, skating in a dream of speed and night, their humps like mountains receding behind each other and their horns a black glisten in the headlights, wind and doom. Then his hands wrenched the wheel toward a slim redemption. The roar is a racket now, shaking Eddie's head apart, a racket, a racket, a racket, like machine gun fire, like he's marine. Oh man, would that make his grandmother proud. But those double moons. Maybe he's been abducted by aliens, he laughs. Wouldn't that be something? The stars lurch in the sky, asphalt and dust. He's crouching, his nose almost touching the chalk circle. Glowing cat's eyes laid scattered within it. The steely squirts from his cocked thumb and smashes into two of them. They explode away from each other and both roll out of the circle. The steely stops like an obedient dog. Eddie raises his eyes. The cat's eyes owner scowls, but he picks them up, holds them out. Eddie lifts his palm to receive them. And marbles, it didn't matter. 
that when he tried to read, the letters twisted like black branches in a storm and turned themselves inside out, or that the paper ripped when he wrote. It was all pressed away by the touch of fingers against his palm and the warm weight of glass there, the bright encased helixes. He always said thank you. He always said good game. He learned to crouch through life, to slip like a shy animal, a mink or fox, to where he was told to sit or stand. He kept his head down, watched his feet, hid his turned around gloves in his pocket, but he couldn't control his grin when he was embarrassed or afraid. Do you think it's funny to rip your paper? I've told you to write with your right hand. Maybe you'll think it's funny to stand with your nose against the chalkboard. So he rose from his desk, still grinning, feeling all those eyes on him, watching his feet pass over the lines of the wooden floor, dirt packed between the slats. He pressed his nose against the chalkboard. He tried to be invisible. One day, one of the white kids brought a bag of marbles to school. The game was an instant sensation. White kids and Indian kids crouching together under the sky. Fathers found old marbles and gave them to their sons, who brought them to school in little mesh sacks. Boys held them up, examining the nicks and the glass and the bright purplings and greenings of light. Each scratch was a cold, the key to a story of conquest. The marbles made scritching sounds like contented shorebirds in flocks when pushed against each other in the bags. Eddie listened. He had no marbles. No scratches to be felt with a fingernail or angle to the light. He wouldn't ask his grandmother to spend money on marbles, and without them he couldn't enter the game or conversation. He watched how his classmates cocked their thumbs, how the shooters careened, how the cat's eyes scattered. With his hand under his desk, as the teacher droned, he practiced the movement, hunched down, watching his thumb flick from his finger invisibly fast. His thumb would be crooked then straight, and nothing in between. Then one afternoon, as he meandered home, he spotted an old bearing race and the Canada thistle and leafy spurge outside the DST machine shop. He knelt and pried it up. Dirt clung to it. Fingers of grass clutched it. It smelled of rust and old oil and green stain like his father's pickup before he'd gone away. Eddie reached through the strands of grass and touched one of the bearings. It wiggled. He pushed it harder, but it wouldn't come out of the race. He looked at the door of the machine shop. He stood in the wrong point of light, the race hanging from his fingers. The mechanic turned from his engine. You need something? Eddie stared at the grease spot in the cement. It looked like a horse trying to run. The mechanic holding his ratchet rubbed the side of his nose at the back of his wrist. His hand put a dark stain in the blonde fuzz on his face. He nodded at the bearing race. You want that there piece of junk, go ahead. Ain't worth nothing to me. The marbles, Eddie said. He held the grass-laced thing up, cupped in his hand a mechanical mess with hard, perfect eggs. Marbles. I can't get them out. The steelies, I tried, but... The white man dropped his ratchet under the bench and grinned. Shit, he said. Bring that son of a bitch over here. He took the race from Eddie and gazed down at it reverently. Those would make a hell of a shooter, huh? He said. Eddie nodded. Well, let's get them sons of bitches out. He banged the race down on the metal table. Eddie watched the marvel of a cutting torch, the flint spark, the snap of the flame, the lazy orange sheet of the acetylene turning hard and blue with steel itself. When the oxygen pushed into it, the grass shriveling and blackening before the flame even reached it, and then the metal brightening, glowing, and finally the extra blast of oxygen that turned the flame into a claw and pried the race apart, spraying sparks. A steely freed clumped onto the cement floor. Eddie bent for it. No, kid! The white man's voice paralyzed him. He stared at the floor, grinning. Sorry, kid, I ain't mad at you. It's that bastard's hot as hell. Wait till I'm done. The mechanic cut the rest of the bearings off and picked them off the floor with pliers, held them in a tank of dirty water, then dried them with a terry cloth as carefully as if they were china. One by one he laid them at his palm, steely's tinged blue as tiny skies, one inch round and deliciously heavy. Jesus, the mechanic said, you got yourself a gold line there. Wished I'd have thought of that when I was a kid. 
The next day, Eddie brought two of the Steelys to school in his pocket. They pressed against his leg when he walked. At recess, he stood over the hunched players, rolling the Steelys between his fingers. I'm in, he finally managed. Faces swiveled, squinting. Bill Lipking sneered. You gotta have marbles to challenge, little brain. Eddie withdrew his hand from his pocket, held it out, opened his fingers. Trade one of these for five cat's eyes. Wow, look at him. Where'd you get him? A chorus of voices. Eddie closed his fist. Anybody? He asked. It turned into an auction. He ended up with eight cat's eyes from Bill Lipkin himself, who recognized in the Steelys a threat and knew enough to buy it out. Eddie lost his eight new marbles, but the next day came to school with another Steely. As the mechanic had said, a gold mine. By the time he traded his fourth Steely, he owned the game. His thumb wrapped itself backwards around a marble so naturally, it seemed an extension of his eyes. I'm gonna skip a little bit now. Several pages. Lowell's hand jerked the wheel back to the right. He'd never handled a semi so roughly, not even that time right after he started driving when that woman was in the wrong lane and he'd started over to avoid her and then she'd come back and he barely missed her. But this time with these buffalo, if the steering wheel had been Abby, he would have wrenched her apart. Yet somehow, this was the wonder. This was what he wanted Lorena to know. He controlled it. That wrenching of the wheel was the most violent thing he'd ever done in his life and the best. The third buffalo was 50 yards between the, behind the first two, it invisible in their shadows, and it snapped into existence when the other two retreated right there in the center of the road, right there, and heading toward the left shoulder, when in another moment he would be. He didn't think. He just moved. He jerked the whole damn rig out of the near oblivion of the ditch and back to the right. He felt the trailer loop behind him. He felt the heave and yaw still moving toward the downslope where if it ever went over, it would roll like a thing not meant to roll and take him with it, tumbling over and over, shooting him into eternity. But somehow, it stayed upright. He felt the cab's wheels under his feet skip and judder, barely holding the surface of the road as the inertia of the trailer pushed against the direction he forced it into. But the tires held, exploding in the cracks of the asphalt, and the whole rig headed back toward the center of the road, shaking and sliding, kids playing whiplash, the end of the chain flying off. Then the center line was under him. He felt the trailer rocking back and forth, rocking, rocking, rock a by, rock a by Abby. It was almost that slow and peaceful and bow breaking, like he could sing the whole lullaby and then just fall down, but not really, couldn't wait. The highway wasn't wide enough, couldn't wait for the trailer to settle, for its wheels to flatten into the road. He pulled the steering wheel left, completing the S, veering away from the right-hand ditch. He saw the third buffalo's thin, flickering tail of his brush of hair lift and fall like a bearded snake. And then the animal was gone into the darkness behind him, gone from his mirrors, gone. But he magnified the rocking when he turned, and horrified, he felt the trailer's right wheels find air and lift right off the pavement. Bareback was like marbles, but he could see ahead, he could see ahead to where the horse is going, by, where the horse was going. So by the time the horse got there, he was already there waiting, and the next jumped too, and the next just waiting. That's what bareback was. Like he was always just waiting. Everything going on, twisting and moving and chaotic, and he in the middle of it, peaceful, waiting. It was weird, man. Horse had to about turn itself inside out to buck him off. And later on, the horse sure tried. When the eight seconds was up and he was pulled off, later on stopped bucking and looked at him. He could about hear that horse say, you are one cowboy, cowboy man, you are one Velcro Indian. But it might have been better if it hadn't happened because that cowboy came up afterwards and shook his hand and said, hell of a ride, you always ride like that? Looks at Eddie like that and asks a question like that, ride like that. What's Eddie supposed to think the way he says it? But Eddie just says sometimes, grins and says sometimes. And that cowboy says, why don't you come down to the horseshoe tonight? Me and some of the other have a few beers. Guy rides like you and should be welcome. The horseshoe was an Indian bar. 
Eddie Wood had never gone there while he was invited. But it went okay, just a bunch of cowboys, didn't matter if one was Indian. Till he got a few too many in him and made a wrong remark to that cowboy. Just a hint. Right away he grinned. Right away he tried to make it like he'd been joking, man. It should have been okay. Except, Eddie laughs again, rolls his head and laughs. And the stars go crazy. He hadn't have been wrong. That was why that cowboy wouldn't let it go. Well, Eddie couldn't grin his way out of it. The others started kidding that cowboy, saying, you two got something going on, little private rodeo? Ain't had enough barebacking for one day, that it? No reason it couldn't have just been joking and drinking and let it go. Except that cowboy had to prove to his friends he wasn't who he was, but he was. Which is why he had to prove he wasn't. Oh, man, bad timing. Should have waited and let that cowboy bring it up. Eddie got the shit beat out of him for bad timing. Too funny. Got turned inside out for bad timing. And never did join the Marines. And had to take a breakaway. Never did carry a flag and a powwow for his grandma so she could see it. Bad timing. Eddie laughs and laughs. Those sons. It sure was getting light out. The trailer was up in its left wheels, like some movie stunt, except it wasn't a goddamn movie. The whole rig was shaking and jangling like Lowell was inside a trap set and the goddamn drummer was on drugs. And then the son of a bitch comes down wham on the other wheels, hard as a goddamn maul against an anvil. He chipped two front teeth and pops up the other way and whams back down again and why the fuck it didn't flip over, he didn't ever know. Except somehow he got inside the pendulum of it and pushed it at just the right time, the littlest pushes on the wheel at the perfect times, and not breaking too hard, but just enough, and the thing stayed on the road and didn't roll, and he wanted to say, Lorena, I've been saved. I don't know why, but it's got something to do with you and Abby, and I swear. He didn't know what he'd swear, but it was something more he put in a new Maytag dishwasher next time he was home. My hands, Lorena. He wanted to lift them up to her face. Look at these hands. They kept that son of a bitching rig on the road. God damn, Lorena, these hands saved me tonight. Saved them all. Saved us all. But he never got it said because it was the phone and he couldn't show her his hands. He could hear her thinking, hello, don't tell me no more stories. And then another night, the same highway, his speed back up after going through Twisted Tree. He thought it was a retread someone had blown, but lights tell lies. He'd been pushing his log limits again and thinking maybe he should just build a whole new house. Maybe if they got out of the old one and moved into a new one that he built himself, things would change. He was seeing it almost, floating down the road in front of him, and then the retread rose up out of the haze of the tiredness. The lights were bouncing up and down. It was behind a little rise in the road. It doesn't take much to hide something in the bounce of headlights. Maybe it was a shadow, or snakes that sometimes lie in the road. That was more daytime, though. You just go right over them. And jackrabbits used to try to avoid them sons of bitches, but that was sure a waste of concentration, the way they buck away from their own shadows until they suck themselves right in under the rig. Deer now were big enough to do some damage. He was cautious with deer, and a few times he'd seen cattle on the highway, but never nothing like them buffalo. Wasn't a snake. Big as it was, had to be a retread. Oh, not the end of that one. I'll let you kind of imagine what might happen there and move to something else, okay? Um, so that's one set of characters uh, in, in, the, in the novel. Um, Another set I'm going to read now, you're going to get some sense of how the, the various images come together here and the, the characters. Um, by the way, that scene came right out of something that happened to me. I was driving a 76 Pinto across South Dakota at about 65 miles an hour uh, near Pier, and uh, a, a buffalo got out of a rancher's, um, <laughs> someone got in the road, and there were three of them, and that's just what I did. You know, I was like one here, and I go around it, and there's one over here. Okay, there's one here. I go right, there's one right here. I come around it, there's one over here. And I took I, this pendulum, went boom, boom, like that. And one of the things you can do, I think, to make a story is to take things that happen in your life that are almost stories 
and just amplify them. And how do you amplify a story like that? You, well, you turn a pinto into a 18-wheeler. You know? <laughs> and, and then you then you have a story. You know? so, um, so, so that that to those students we've been talking about, you know, how do you how do you take things and make them into stories? That that might be instructive. Um, this particular part I'm going to read now also comes out of a, a story I heard, a South Dakota story um, that I heard from somebody, heard it from somebody, um, and it has to do with rattlesnakes. You notice the Lowell's worried about rattlesnakes on the road, so rattlesnakes are another kind of motif that run through this through this entire novel. Um, Angela Morrison in this uh, story is having an affair with the Catholic priest. Uh, she is pregnant by the priest. Her husband does not know this. Brock doesn't know it. Um, that's kind of where the story picks up. Four years into their marriage, still childless and starting to believe he always would be, Brock walked into the house one afternoon and heard the telephone buzzing. He called out for Angela but got no answer, then looked in the garage to see if the car was gone. He stared at its solid presence, wondering why he would think the phone off the hook had something to do with the car. Then he realized he'd imagined it gone for good. He'd never considered Ange would just pick up and leave, but there the thought was, as if it came out of the garage itself or out of the angry, insistent buzzing of the phone, a vision of the car gone and the house empty, and he staring into the drawer where they kept the can opener, figuring out the business of supper. The vision, brief as it was, frightened him. He tried to shake it from his mind as he walked through the entryway. He went to the kitchen, saw the phone hanging from its coiled cord and replaced it in the cradle. When the buzzing stopped, the house was completely silent. He thought he might hear her breathing somewhere. He walked into the living room and was startled to find her staring out the window, her back to him. She didn't turn around. She's telling me she's leaving, he thought. They stood in the colloidal silence. Speaking in a monotone at the window, Angela said, Roberta, my sister, called. Mom had an aneurysm. She's gone, just like that. Oh, my God, Ange. He'd almost said, thank God. It wasn't supposed to happen, she said. I can't believe it. He saw her shake her head as if trying to dislodge other words. He stepped across the room. He thought she'd turn to him, but she didn't, so he put his arms around her from behind, put his head over her shoulder, his cheek against her hair. In the window's faint reflection, their hair blended together so that he couldn't tell hers from his. Her body didn't change under his touch. It wasn't a time for disappointment, but Brock was disappointed. He wanted his body right now to mean something to her to have at least the power of comfort. I'll call Stanley Zimmerman to do chores, he said. We can leave in the morning. If she had turned and folded herself into him, if her limbs had loosened, if the conformations of her body changed against him, he might have said things less pragmatic, less tuned to action and solution. Her shoulder blades stiffened even more. Look at those snakes on that rock, she said. Her mother had just died, and here she was with this old argument. She's been trying to get him to get rid of the snakes on the ranch for ever since their marriage started. Brock couldn't see anything on the rocks, and as far as he knew, his eyesight was good. He opened his arms and stepped back. Actually, the Zimmerman's just had that baby girl, he said. You give birth in a car, you ought to get a break from doing chores. I'll call Richard Mattingly. That girl is Haley Jo Zimmerman, so that's her, that's her birth, and she's, the book ends with her death. So you see some sense of how this fitting together. On the way to Sioux Falls the next morning, when Brock saw the small wayside rest along the two-lane road they were taking east, he pulled over. He didn't need a restroom, he just needed to be alone. He didn't understand the depth of the silence in the car. He pulled up to the unmowed lawn that bordered the area, parked parallel to it, and got out, stumbling over a rock hidden in the crabgrass and nearly touching the bottom of the door frame. He left the door open and made his way to the cinder block restroom. In the stale semi-darkness, he leaned against a concrete wall and looked at himself in the mirror over the enamel sink. It was an old mirror, wavy and water-spotted, and it made his face look saggy. 
the night before he got out after supper to make sure things were in place for Richard Mattingly. When he returned to the house, he found Angela sitting on the couch, her eyes swollen, her face red. He had a guilty, uneasy feeling that her grief was out of proportion. He got along with her mother better than she did. But it wasn't fair to judge someone else's grieving, and he sure couldn't ask her why her mother's death bothered her so much. And she said gently, you packed yet? He went to her, held out his hand. You got to pack, he said. She let him pull her off the couch and took her to the bedroom. She sat on the edge of the bed while he pulled things from the closet, and if she nodded, he put them in a suitcase. When they both returned from the restroom, he asked if she could drive. He wanted to escape her silence. If he stayed awake, it would wear him down, or he'd have to probe it, and that would wear him down too. He crawled into the back seat and fell almost instantly asleep. Angela stared into the low rising sun. Dozens of times last night while Brock was outside, she tried to call Caleb, the priest. When she'd heard Brock open the door, she burst into tears and gone to the couch and tried to compose herself. Again this morning she tried, then remembered Caleb was in Rapid City, out of touch. The astonishing fact of it left her numb. Events were sweeping her along way, way beyond her control, and the one person she had to talk to, she couldn't. Ten miles down the road, she felt a touch of low breeze on her foot. She shifted her leg away from it, but in a few moments, the touch came again, harder and sensuous. She unlocked her eyes from the light before her and leaned over and peered through the steering wheel at her feet. For a moment, she could see nothing, could only feel, not even a touch, a pressure on her ankle. Then the sunlight, still blinding her, faded out of her eyes like a surface breaking up, and the dim floor of the car took shape underneath it. Her breath was jerked from her chest. A rattlesnake, thick as her forearm, lay under the clutch and brake pedal, its blunt triangular head touching her ankle, softly as air. She tried to speak, but her throat closed around Brock's name. The snake moved. It flowed past her feet, long and easy in the dim light near the floor, its body looping against her. The muscles were like waves of stiffened water, the scales smooth and school, cool. It could have been silk. It could have been nothing. It eased itself under the brake pedal and paws, loosely stretched out, its head upon her sandal, its tongue flickering. She heard a faraway moaning, rolling until it penetrated the blanket of horror that enveloped her, a semi's air horn. The greater danger pulled her eyes up, the horn devastatingly loud. She was in the left lane, a great blunt square of chrome and painted metal, 50 yards away. She jerked the wheel to the right, her foot still frozen to the accelerator, as if the top and bottom of her body were disconnected. The car yawed into the right lane, bouncing on its shocks, just as the semi's left wheel crossed the center line, moving to avoid her. She could see the driver's startled eyes as he pulled back, a young man, her own age, wearing a baseball cap, and then they were sliding by each other, a foot away, the trailer flickering as sunlight careened off it. And then the trailer and the mirror swaying and diminishing, its brake lights glaring red. But she was going, she was non-stop, alone, the empty road. In the back seat, Brock stirred but didn't wake. The snake's tongue and the underlying fangs folded back were inches from her foot. If she moved or spoke, she was sure it would strike. But she had to see Brock, had to know she wasn't alone. Brock had once told her to move slowly around animals. She remembered that and let her hand drift off the steering wheel as if the air were lifting it to the mirror. She slowly rotated it down until she could see his face in its oblong circumference, his closed eyes, his mouth that seemed to be half smiling, though his face was vacant, the white tips of his teeth. She touched his face within the mirror as if to wake him there. Then she let her hand return to the steering wheel and willed her own paralysis. The snake's tongue broke the air. It curved along the foot floor of the car, its scales scraping the plastic mat, its head moving away from her foot. Then it doubled back on itself, relapsed into stillness as if removing itself from the world, miles and wind and light pouring down. Then movement again, completed at once, and its chiseled face returning. She was wearing shorts, and she knew what the snake was about to do. And though she prayed that it would not, it did. Though she prayed to God to kill it, it remained alive. 
Its head moved forward, its tongue white as an insect brushed her bare ankle. Then it raised its head. It lay the bony part of its jaw on her instep, rested there a moment, then glided up onto her, the flex of its body pushing against her bare skin. She could feel the muscles working beneath the scales, and for a moment the animal was staring into her face through the spokes of the steering wheel. Its mouth, under the heat sensing concavities in its face, was slightly open. The white fangs were curled back against the rope. It moved farther up, the scales cool, pushing. It came onto her lap, hung its head over the air toward the door. The thickness of the thing gripped her skin. The car pounded down the road. Even her prayers had stopped. She had never been so isolated. All calling out contained, her skin a border defining her in opposition to the world. Brock stirred. In the mirror, his eyes remained shut, his face calm and glowing, ardently oblivious, the face of a stranger in another realm. The snake curled its head back toward her, hesitated, then laid it on her thigh. She felt the loops of its body tighten momentarily, and then the muscles under the scales relaxed and went still. The lidless eyes remained open, but she knew it had gone to sleep. It had put an infant's charm on her, had curled up on her lap and gone to sleep. It had made of her stillness a stillness of care. Brock stirred again. He struggled as if trying to remain asleep and slowly sat up, his foot bumped her seat back. She could no longer feel the snake against her legs. It had borrowed her warmth, her skin, its skin. Where are we, Brock mumbled, how far we come? She couldn't answer. She glanced in the mirror to find him, moving only her eyes, but she turned the mirror down and his face was gone from it. Nothing there but an empty pillow with a depression in the center. Ange, come on now, you gotta start talking. I'm just asking where we're at. Then he sensed a new depth in her silence and pulled himself forward. Ange, you're sleeping at the wheel? She could feel his breath in her hair and smell the tang of sleep in it and the sweat on his skin. Then he put his head over the seat and his breathing stopped. Jesus Christ, he whispered. All those S's moving in her hair, meeting her ear, not just sound, but touch, a tiny connected thread, words that were barely words, coming to her far under the louder sounds of tires and road seams. She felt the seat move backwards as Brock slowly pulled himself forward. She knew he was peering sideways into her face, though she didn't turn her head to, to him, didn't do anything that would wake the sleeping creature in her lap. Brock's breath came out in a long sigh. She wanted to lean into it, and she wanted to jerk away from it, but she didn't either, and for a moment her stillness protected everything. Then in a movement so swift, Angela was never able to recreate it. Brock's right hand shot around the seat back under her arm and clamped onto the snake just behind its head. It erupted to light, writhing in the air as he jerked it up and hauled it out, its coils striking her shoulders and chest. Its rattle went off, filling the car. She felt that rattle for a moment vibrating, hot as a brand against her bare thigh. The mouth in front of Brock's fist opened wide with curving teeth. Stop the car, he yelled. The snake thrashed, its tail looped around her right shoulder and arm, clinging, the rattle near her ear like delirium, like light, a bright thing in her brain, and for a moment she couldn't see the road. She might have blacked out. Then the high was unwinding before her again, and the snake was gone, the rattle shrilling behind her, and over at Brock, yelling at her to stop. But she couldn't stop. She was paralyzed and fleeing both, and in the rear view mirror, she saw the pillow and on it the stake's wizened head and accusing eyes. It had slept on her skin. In time, she would speak to Brock of this, but he would just shake his head and tell her it was just being a snake all along, just being a snake, just confused <laughs> by the vibrations and heat of the car. Couldn't even distinguish her. That's all that had happened, nothing more. She even probably could have called to wake him. Snakes can't hear. It would have just been another vibration added to the chaos. The air pressure outside, the, inside the car changed as Brock opened the rear window. No, Brock, she cried, except she didn't. The words would have given him pause, but she never spoke them. 
In the side mirror, the stake twisted in the car's false wind, awkward and out of its element, an antithesis of bird, a deformity of wing. It hit the road, it rolled like a hose, but its rattle still filled the car. Then she realized her scream and replaced it, language degraded into anarchy, blanketing the word she held inside. She felt Rock's hand on her, in her hair, against her shoulders, rubbing hard into her, and she heard his calm voice in her ear. You can stop now, Anne. Just go ahead and lift your foot. You know how to do that. Go ahead and lift your foot. But her feet were rigid and far away. Her body was far away, and she was fleeing it. Then Brock, still rubbing her shoulders, still moving his hands against her, still in the same soft, melodious chant, but lighter, almost laughing, said, No need to hurry like this, Ange. Your ma won't be any deader if we get there a few minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll quit there. <laughs> Yeah, that, that actually was a story that I heard um, that about almost, you know, in some ways word for word that this couple was driving, they weren't going to a their mother's funeral, but they were driving across South Dakota and they stopped at these, one of these little wayside rests um, that are really nothing more than, um, you know, a little grassy plot with a, often just a uh, cement bathroom. And uh, they stopped and they left the door open and there was a rock near the door and um, they both left the car and when they came back um, they switched drivers and the woman driving um, got in and the snake was on the floorboard of the car after she started and she drove like 50 miles before um, the husband woke up and, and helped her get rid of it. So that was that straight out of a I mean, I don't know the story is really true. I think it is, but it's one of those, you know, it's one of those circulating stories that, that, that probably many of you have similar sorts of things, like, yeah, did you hear the one about? Did you hear this, this happened over near, you know, Pullman? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so again, you know, to talk about, if you don't mind a little craft talk up here, that you, know, you could take something like that and just put it into a different context and, and make it, meaningful somehow, and it, it can really become literary. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, what book was that you just read from? This one is Twisted Tree, is the title of the book. And yes. the first one? Um, that was also Twisted Tree. Okay. Um, the Work of Wolves is the book that preceded this one, and they're not really sequels, but they're both set in the same in the same town, the same area of, uh, and it's a fictional town in South Dakota, and the only character who moves from one book to the other is a sheriff named Greggy Longwell. Um, but um, yeah, the work of Wills, but this book is Twisted Tree. This is the later book. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, what are you working on now? I'm working on another novel, and I've been working on it for um, five going on six years, and I was supposed to have it done two going on three years ago. <laughs> um, it's just giving me fits. Um, it begins with a couple of 13-year-old boys who got given permission by their parents to take a, a very stable, safe boat down a stable river um, to a picnic the families are having. And it, during the very last week before they do this trip, um, another family um, joins them and they've got an 11-year-old boy that these two 13-year-olds don't really like and the parents kind of insist he be allowed to go also and on that trip he drowns through circumstances that are very very ambivalent even the two young the 13-year-olds aren't quite sure just what causes it and so the novel is about what you know what are the consequences to these these families as a result of that the biggest thing in the book is that the the one of the brothers, uh, six-year-old sister, Josie, is never told. Uh, the family tries to hide that from her. And, and they're successful, they hide that from her. They basically erase her memory. 
And so when she's 18 years old, she discovers this and it just shatters her because she feels like she's never been part of the family. And, and so the, the book is about, you know, what happens. And so I really, I guess I'm really like into secrecy and what secrecy does to people. And so in trying to kind of save her from a tragedy, they, they really create a situation that is quite traumatic and the book explores that, you know. And, and explores and explores and explores it. I wish it would quit exploring it. <laughs> <laughs> so I could be done with it. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Uh, so, Kent will be signing books, and books are for sale out there as well. He'll be signing right to the left. Um, can you give Kent one more round of applause for? Thank you.